Welcome to Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylanda Butterworth, and today we begin with the tale of Pelops. Tantalus had done the gods great wrong. His sons Pelops honored them devoutly. After his father had been thrust down to Hades, a war with his neighbor, the king of Troy, drove Pelops from his own country of Lydia, and he journeyed to Greece. The chin of the youth was only just touched with the first dark down, but his heart had already chosen a wife. It was Hippodamia, the daughter of King Oemanus of Elis, and she was a prize not easily won. For an oracle had foretold that the king would die when his daughter married, and so he did all he could to keep the suitors at a distance. Throughout the land he issued a proclamation that he would wed his daughter, must first defeat her father in a chariot race. If, however, the king were victorious, the contestant was to forfeit his life. The race was to begin at Pisa, and it at Poseidon's altar, and the Ithymus of Corinth. And the start, Oemaeus, arranged as follows. He would first sacrifice a ram to Zeus, taking his time about it, while the suitor set off in his four-horse chariot. Only when the rites of offerings were duly fulfilled would he begin the race and pursue the other with his spear in hand. In the chariot guided by Myrtilius, his charioteer, if he caught up with him, he should have the right to pierce him to the heart. When the many youths who wooed Hippodamia for her beauty heard these conditions, they were of good courage, for they regarded the king as a feeble old man, and who knew very well that he could not race with the young, and gave them so great a start in order to explain his profitable defeat by this act of generosity. One after another came to Ellis and asked the king for his daughter. He received each in a most friendly manner, gave him a splendid four-horse chariot, and went to sacrifice a ram to Zeus without the slightest show of haste. Only then did he mount his light chariot drawn by his two mares, Phila and Harpina, who ran swifter than the north wind. Each time the charioteer caught up with the suitor long before the goal was reached, and the cruel king pierced them with his spear through the heart. In this fashion, he had already slain more than twelve youth. On the way to his beloved, Pelops had landed on the peninsula, which was one day to bear his name. He soon heard all that had happened in Ellis. At nightfall, he went to the shore and called upon his patron god. Poseidon, swinger of the mighty trident, and the waves parted, and he sur surged up through the sea. Oh, Poseidon, cried Pelops, if the gifts of Aphrodite are welcome to you, turn the sharp spear of Onimenus from me. Send me to Ellis in the swiftest chariot and lead me to victory. Already he has destroyed thirteen wooers, and he is still putting off marriage for his daughter. Great dangers call for a brave spirit. I am determined to try my luck. I must die some day, so why sit in gloom, awaiting inglorious old age, and share in no brilliant conquest? I want to undertake this race. Give me the success I pray for. And Pelops did not plead in vain. For again the waves surged and parted, and a chariot of shimmering gold with four winged horses, swift as arrows, rose from the depths. On this, Pelops sped to Ellis, guiding the sea god's horses at will and outrunning the wind. When Onomaeus saw him coming, he quailed, for he recognized Poseidon's chariot at a glance. But he did not refuse to race with the stranger at all on the usual conditions. After Pelops' horses had rested from their journey along the isthmus, he started them off on the race track. He was close to the goal when the king, who had sacrificed the ram, according to his custom, 
suddenly caught up with him, brandishing his spear to deal the bold suitor a swift death. But Poseidon, the protector of Pelops, loosened the wheel of the king's chariot while it was going at full speed so that it crashed to the earth. Onimaeus fell and was killed instantly. At that very moment, Pelops reached the goal. When he looked back, he saw the king's palace in flames. A flash of lightning had set it afire and destroyed it until only a single pillar was left standing. But Pelops sped toward the burning house in his winged chariot and fetched his bride out of the ruins. Naobi Niobe, queen of Thebes, had much to be proud of. The muses had given her husband, Amphion, a lyre whose strings breathed sounds of such persuasive sweetness that once at his playing the very stones had joined together to rear the palace of Thebes. Her father was Tantalus, the guest of the immortals. She herself ruled over a mighty realm, and was famed for her noble spirit, for her beauty, and for her stateliness. But nothing made her heart beat higher than the thought of her fourteen children, seven sons and seven daughters. Niobe was known as the happiest of all mothers, and this she would indeed have been had she not vaunted her happiness too exultantly, as it was, her awareness of it proved her destruction. One day, the seer's Manto, daughter of Tyrius, was moved to cry out in the streets, exhorting the women of Thebes to do honor to Leto and her twin children, Apollo and Artemis. She bade them wreath their brows with laurels, make fervent prayer, and offer a sacrifice. While the women of Thebes gathered to listen, Niobe suddenly appeared amid a throng of her followers. She wore a gown worked with golden thread. Radiant in her beauty, except where anger clouded her countenance, tossing her lovely head with its lustrous hair rippling down over her shoulders, she stood among the women who were preparing the sacrifice under the open sky. Her haughty glances swept over the assembly. And she said, Are you mad that you honor the gods who are no more than idle tales among you, while beings more favored by heaven actually dwell in your midst? You set up altar Salito. Why does not incense rise to my divine name? Is not my father Tantalus the only mortal who ever ate at the board of Zeus? My mother, Dione, is sister to the Pleiades, who shine as a brilliant constellation in the skies? One of my ancestors, Atlas, was so strong that he carried the broad heavens on his shoulders. My father's father is Zeus himself. Even, even the people of Phrygia obey me. The city of Cadmus, the walls that rose to the playing of Amphion, are subject to me and my husband. Every chamber in my palace is filled with marvelous treasures. Add to this that I have a face worthy of a goddess, and children such as no other mother can boast of, seven flower-like daughters, and seven sturdy sons, and soon I shall have an equal number of sons and daughter-in-laws. But you have the boldness to put to me Leto, the unknown daughter of Titans? whom the wide earth once grudged even a little space wherein to bear children to Zeus, until the floating island of Delos took pity on her and granted her a temporary refuge. And there the poor creature bore her two children, a mere seventh part of my joy-bringing harvest. Who will deny that I am happy? Who will doubt that I shall remain so? The fates would have much to do if they set about harming my possessions. Even if they took one of the other of my brood, how could their number ever sink to a mere two such as Leto's children? So away with your offerings. Snatch the wreaths off your heads 
disperse and go home and never again let me find you engaged in such foolishness. The women were afraid. They tore the laurels from their brows, left the sacrifice unfinished, and crept home, honoring the offended goddess with silent prayers. On the peak of Mount Cynthias and Delos stood Leto with her twin children, gazing with divine eyes upon what was happening in far-off Thebes. Behold, my children, she said, I, your mother, who am so proud to have borne you, I, who give place to no goddess but Hera, must suffer the disdain of insolent mortals. Unless you aid me, I shall be thrust away from my ancient holy altars. Yes? and Niobe is slandering you also by placing you second to her own brood. She was complaining thus when Phoebus interrupted her. Leave off, lamenting mother, he said. You are only delaying punishment. And his sister seconded him. Both veiled themselves in cloud and sped through the air to the city of Cadmus. Before its walls was a spacious field, not intended for sowing and reaping, but for races and practice with horses and chariots. There, the seven sons of Amphion were engaged in a gay sport. Ismenus, the eldest, was just driving his mount in a circle in a trot, reining him in with a sure hand close to the bit of his foaming flecked mouth, when suddenly groaned, Alas! and the rain slipped from his powerless finger to the heart by an arrow. He slowly sank to the earth at the horse's right flank. His brother Scythias, who was nearest him, had heard a quiver rattling in the air and fled at full gallop, like a helmsman who catches the lightest wind in his sails to make harbor before the storm. And yet an arrow, whirring down from the sky, pierced him in the nape of the neck, and its iron point jutted from his throat. Over the mane of his speeding horse, he slid to the ground and spattered the earth with his blood. Two others, Tantalus, named after his grandfather, and Phidemus, were wrestling with each other, locked breast to breast. One more, the bowstrings twang, and an arrow stabbed both of them at once. They moaned, writhed in the earth, their limbs contorted with pain, their eyes dimmed and they died in the dust in the self-same moment. A fifth son, Alphenor, saw them fall. Beating his breast, he ran toward them and tried to warm the cold bodies of his brothers in his embrace. But while he was performing this office of love, Apollo launched a deadly dart at him, and when he drew it forth from his heart, his blood and breath flowed from him. Damasithon, a charming youth with long locks, was struck in the hollow of the knee, and when he bent backward to pull out the missile, a second arrow entered his open mouth up to the feathering, and his blood spurted out like a fountain. Ilenos, the boy, the last and the youngest son, who had watched his brother perish one after another, fell on his knees, spread wide his arms, and began to plead, O oh gods, all ye gods, spare me! Even the grim archer was moved to compassion. But it was too late. The arrow could not be recalled. The boy fell, but he died of a painless wound, but the point barely grazed his heart. Rumor of the disaster soon spread through the city. When Amphion heard the awful tidings, he pierced his own breast with his sword. Presently, the loud laments of the servants and the people reached the women's chamber. For a long time, Niobe could not grasp her misfortune. She did not want to believe the immortals had so much power that they dared, that they had succeeded. But soon she could no longer doubt the truth. Ah, oh, how different was this Niobe from her who had just driven all the people away from the altars of the mighty goddess and paced through the city, her head held high. Then she had seemed enviable to her dearest friends, but now she evoked only pity, even from her foes. She rushed out to the field and threw herself on the cold bodies of her sons, 
kissing now this one and now that. Then she lifted her weary arms to the sky and cried, Gloat over my misery. Sate your angry heart, cruel Leto. Gloat over me. The death of these seven will cast me into the grave. Triumph over me. Yours is the victory. Now, her seven daughters, already garbed in mourning and with loosened locks, came and stood beside their fallen brothers. At sight of them, a gleam of malice flickered over Niobe's pale face. She forgot herself, shot a mocking glance at the sky and said, Victory? No. Even in my wretchedness, I have more than you in your triumph. Though all these are dead, I am still richer. Hardly had the words left her lips when through the air came a sound as of a sinew tightening on the bow. Everyone trembled. All but Niobe, whom disaster had dulled. Suddenly, one of the sisters put her hand to her heart and drew at an arrow. She fainted, and as she fell, turned her dying gaze upon the dead body of the brother lying next to her. Another of the girls hastened to her mother to give her words of comfort, but her mouth was forever closed by an unseen dart. A third fell as she turned to flee, and still others faltered while they bowed over their dead sisters. Only the youngest was left. She fled to her mother, hid her face against her knees, and clung to her, covering herself with the folds of her robe. Leave me this one! Even as she uttered her plea, the child loosened her hold on her. And now Niobe sat alone among the bodies of her sons and her daughters. She grew rigid with sorrow. Not a hair on her head stirred in the wind. The color ebbed from her cheeks. Her eyes stared motionless in her ravaged face. The blood stopped running in her veins. Her pulse fluttered and died. Her neck, her arms, her feet were utterly still. Even her heart had turned to stone. She was lifeless, save the tears flowing unceasingly from her stark eyes. And now a tempest swept her through the air and across the sea to her old home in Lydia and set her down among the cliffs of Cyprius. Here on the peak of the mountain, she still stands, a block of marble, which even now is washed with her tears. Salomonius Salmonius ruled over Ellis. He was a wealthy and an unjust prince with an arrogant heart. He had founded a beautiful city and called it Salmonia. And he grew so overbearing in his pride that he commanded his subjects to give him the honors and offerings due to a god. He wanted to be taken for Zeus himself, and he traversed his country and other parts of Greece in a chariot meant to resemble that of the Thunderer. To accomplish this, he tried to imitate lightning with torches launched through the air and thunder with the hoofbeats of champing horses which he drove over a brazen bridge. He even had people killed and then pretended that his lightning had struck them down. From the heights of Olympus, Zeus noted this folly. He reached into the thick of the clouds, drew forth a real thunderbolt, and hurled it at this mortal, raging in madness and distance below. The bolt shattered the king and destroyed the city he had built with all those who dwelt in it. And here I finish my tales for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Until then, enjoy the journey.